Happy Friday to you all. Thank you for joining us. We're excited to be back today. We have a great show. Um, we have a lot of guests coming on, Skyping in, so we're really excited for that. I want to thank Lexi Cassell yet again for your song, Love It. Um, you are original, and uh, we are original, so it's, it's so fitting. Um, I want to thank Zap My Tax and Zap My Insurance for sponsoring us. We couldn't be here without them, so I want to thank you for that, Zap My Tax. We'll get back to educating you about your property taxes at some point later in the show. Uh, Christine, we had a great show last week, right? We did have a great show, and I think for our first time, we've kicked it off very positively and feeling really confident about today's show and hopefully being able to share a lot of information with you all on the topic of breast cancer. Yep. But just to go back, um, with last week, we want to thank Anne-Marie from Lola's Lookbook, and uh, we had um, Lauren and, I'm sorry, and I forgot her first name, and Liz from Nicolette, so we want to say thank you for that. Um, we also want to remind you guys, if there's anyone out there that wants to sponsor us, please contact Lori Fay or Christine McCauley. We're open to any sponsorships. If uh, maybe, you know, a crazy band or... Um, or uh, a marketing person wants to be a part of the show, we're open to anything. So if you'd like to lend a song to the show, we are only allowed to play uh, original music, so that would be very helpful for us to have you on, and it will be helpful to you. Uh, the owner of the studio also um, hosts a live jam here at Paradise Studios uh, every Thursday night. I'm not sure of the time, but you could find it on Facebook. They have a beautiful studio here that you can come in with your band. I think it's a minimal uh, donation to the studio, and you can play. So um, it's a great thing. Um, and, and please, if any of you have a topic that you feel passionate about or that you feel is important and relevant to the things that are going on here on Long Island and in the world, please reach out to us via Facebook or on our page, The Living Room, and we would be happy to put something together, have you on, and share the information that you think is important for everyone. There's no business, no personal story. Even children, there's nothing that we wouldn't um, welcome on the show. This show is about living, it's about life. Christine and I are mothers, we're wives, we're sisters, we're, we're daughters, um, and we just want to contribute to uh, the wellness of everyone's life. So if there's something that you want to share, it would be great for us to be a part of it. And it's really an open forum here, so you can come and just, you know, spend an hour on the couch. And you don't have to pay $150. Exactly. So um, please, we welcome it. Uh, I think we're going to take a short break, um, and thank you, Zap My Tax, for, for being here for us. We appreciate it. When we come back, uh, Christine will introduce our first guest. Be right back. Thank you. Given what we know about the benefits of filing a property tax grievance, experts agree it should be mandatory. Use a professional. Choose Zap My Tax. File at ZapMyTax.com. Deadline approaching. Hi, welcome back. Uh, we are going to be discussing today um, topics uh, in relation to breast cancer. And Christine is going to announce our first guest. I'm very pleased to introduce to you today uh, two women from an amazing organization called Protect Our Breasts. And you can find them at protectourbreasts.org on the internet. And our first guest is Cynthia Barstow. She is the founder and executive director of Protect Our Breasts, which is an organization dedicated and committed to increasing awareness about the detriments that certain chemicals and things that in disrupt our endocrine system uh, and how they relate to breast cancer. 
With her today is Sophie Rosenberg, who is the science director of Protect Our Breasts. And they're going to teach us. They're going to tell us what we need to do know to protect ourselves and all the women that we love. And they're Skyping in. So I don't know the relationship on the screen, but hopefully you're going to see them. They're going to see us, and we can have the conversation via technology. Okay. It's a wonderful thing. Good morning, ladies. How are you? Thank you so Good much morning. for coming on. Thank you for having us. So, Cynthia, um, yeah. tell, uh, tell us what Protect, Protect Our Breasts is, what it's about, why you started it. Sure. So before I even get started, the first thing that I would like to say is that Long Island is a place that has been ahead of the curve in terms of breast cancer and the environment for an awfully long time. The, the Huntington Breast Cancer uh, Action Coalition is amazing. So I just want to put out there that if anybody is listening, uh, watching your show from um, Long Island and is involved with that organization, you guys are doing amazing, amazing things. Wonderful. So Protect Our Breasts actually started from my own personal breast cancer um, that came in 2010. When I was diagnosed, I did what a lot of other people do, which is to do a lot of research and try to learn as much as I possibly could. So in that time, the Oddly enough, the president's cancer panel had just come out with a report on cancer on the environmental situation as it related to cancers. And they had said that we have grossly underestimated the role of environmental toxins and cancers. At that time, I was really flummoxed because I had already been very involved in the whole world of sustainable agriculture. Not only have I taught here at the university about sustainable agriculture and, and the food industry and whatnot, but I'd also written a book called The Eco Foods Guide, which came out in 2002 about organic and GMOs and all the many things that we are concerned about as it relates to the food industry. So I knew an awful lot about pesticides particularly. So when this cancer panel uh, report came out indicating that uh, toxins were having an awful lot to do with breast cancer, I was particularly fascinated and learned a tremendous amount. So as I was going through my own recovery and my own treatments, because I was involved with the natural and organic industry anyway, I was asked, I had been asked to speak on organic at the natural and organic trade show. At that time it was in Boston. And I was sitting in on a session that actually Gary Hirschberg from Stonyfield Farm was, was uh, sharing and his wife Meg had gone through um, tremendous breast cancer problems and uh, treatment and she's well and, and thank God and all that. But um, at the time he made an important statement that for me really, it, it pulled it all together, which was we can pay now for organic or we can pay our hospital bills later in our lives. And I realized that we needed to make a better connection around these chemicals and the various cancers. but particularly for me, it was around breast cancer. So I teach in the Eisenberg School of Management here at the University of Massachusetts. And I had a number of students who were interested in learning more about this as I was sharing in classes. And they asked if we could get together and potentially write another book. And they started to do the research and this was in the winter of between 2010 to 2011. And they said at one point, you know what? We, we can't wait to write a book to get this information out there. We need to actually start sharing this with our families and our friends and our aunts and our grandmothers and, and whatnot. Is this, is this mostly women, mostly young girls or, the, or young men involved as well? So this will dovetail into something that is really run by college age women. And we also work with high school students as ambassadors as well. But at the point that I'm talking about right now in 2010, when we first first starting as a college age women and, and myself who were kind of talking about this, um, it, it was it hadn't formed yet into a thing. We were still in the conversation stage. And oddly enough, I 
um, sent out some information asking to be trained and was flown to California to be trained along with people from Susan G. Coleman and many other breast cancer organizations about the connection between breast cancer and the environment. Simultaneously, the girl said, let's do a Facebook page. Let's start putting things out on social media. So in October of 2011, we launched Protect Our Breasts as a social media um, sharing platform. You were ahead of the curve. Now, the important part of this story actually came in December of 2011. Even though we had launched and we were working with our science director, Dr. Thomas Zeller, who is an endocrine disruption specialist, the fact is that in December of 2011, the Institute of Medicine came out with a report saying that it was women up through their first full-term pregnancy that were susceptible to the toxins that could set you up for a breast cancer diagnosis later in life. That was actually a question that I had. If there were women, specific women, that had um, a higher risk to these endocrine disruptors, um, whether they have other diseases like autoimmune issues or a prior cancer, or as you said, the location that they live in, like here on Long Island. So are some women more susceptible to... So, so Sophie will talk a little bit more about the windows of susceptibility, but okay. the fact of the matter is that many of these toxins are actually having an effect up through a woman's first full-term pregnancy as your mammary glands are constantly changing. Wow. So when you ask no, about are there particular groups that are more susceptible, there are a variety of answers to that question. We know that, for example, that Long Island and Cape Cod here in Massachusetts are both cancer clusters, mm. but when it, we look at breast cancer and toxins specifically, we are very concerned about this window of susceptibility. And we believe that if we can help younger women change out products that have chemicals that can be a problem for uh, products that are organic or do not have concerning chemicals, then we can actually help to prevent breast cancer. Wow. So when it comes to young women, I was surrounded by these college age, uh, fabulous, outgoing leaders, women, and they said, we've got to start this organization in a way that's a little different than we had originally intended and start talking to our peers, which is exactly what happened. So from that moment in December of 2011, we started to build our social media platforms. We now have over 11,000 following us on Facebook, wow, and another number um, on Instagram and Twitter and other platforms as well. But we also have college chapters and high school chapters. Wow. So how many do you have? have uh, excuse me? How many wow. chapters are there of the organization? There are seven colleges and two high schools right now. That's terrific. And we are always excited to add on a few others. As a matter of fact, I, I think I heard that there might be a person that's interested in starting a ch chapter at Alfred University. So that would be very exciting for Long Island. And anyone who is uh, interested would reach out to you on your website? Yes, there is a place on our website at protectourbreast.org that uh, if you just go on the site, you'll a tab, there's all sorts of information about what it takes to start a chapter and, and um, an area to fill out. So Excellent. anybody who's interested in starting a chapter, um, we walk them through the process. And then, it's very exciting, um, I'm going to actually pass it over to Sophie now for a second because she'll tell you the kinds of information that we share with our ambassadors that are on the college um, campuses is all science-based. We are all science-based. We are very concerned about not sharing information that is frightening, unnecessarily. Or not confirmed. We, excuse me? Or not confirmed. Exactly. We want to make sure that we have scientific evidence from peer-reviewed journal articles that actually affirm and, and confirm the um, information that we're putting out on our social media and to our ambassadors. So one of the things that Sophie's been working on this past year has been putting together a science database. 
So I'd love to pass it over to Sophie and have her tell you a little bit more about that. Great. Welcome, Sophie. Thank you so much. Hi, so I'm Sophie. I'm a junior and I'm a public health major and I'm pre-med and in the honors college here at UMass. And I'm the science director of Protect Our Breasts. Thank you so much for having us. I'm so excited to be here. So essentially, Protect Our Breasts, we're a nonprofit and we do peer-to-peer -peer level education on the synthetic chemicals in our everyday products and environment that can contribute to a breast cancer diagnosis later on in life. And this has been a really cool opportunity for me to read science, get actual information, and as a public health major, be able to take the science and translate it into digestible facts for college age women to actually prevent breast cancer by choosing safer alternatives and becoming more aware. So, Are you gonna be listing some just, of those with us today? I'd love to hear a list of some of these products. So, <laughs> there's a lot. Okay. So, I mean, we have different categories that each person on the executive board is responsible for researching. So my specific category is plastics and packaging. So some helpful tips for plastic and packaging is to avoid in the recycling number, like in the recycling logo, you'll see a little number and inside. So three, six and seven are the most harmful Hold of on. the plastics. So Get all of those glasses. plastics, I think, have BPA, they have polystyrene and um, I'm blanking on the last one, but they have all these different chemicals in them. And oftentimes we're drinking a lid that is number seven. And so you're putting a hot liquid through a plastic that has chemicals that is harmful. And so you're being exposed to all those chemicals when you're ingesting them. Three, six, or seven. Everyone else has different categories. Where, where so we does have one find things. that on say uh, this typical water bottle that I have here? Yeah, that's plastic number one. And plastic number one is often PET, E, you can see it on the bottom and it'll say normally next to it which number it is and that is an okay plastic I mean you can drink it on the first time but we recommend that you don't refill it because the chemicals kind of get more volatile it, and they kind of leach really as they break down the I, I'm a big culprit water. of refilling a what water about, bottle what about freezing this bottle or leaving it in your car <laughs> no definitely not don't do that it just it, going to alter the chemicals and they're going to be either more into leaching into the product and it's just not a good idea. Okay. I mean, I always recommend that people drink out of stainless steel or glass um, to avoid any harmful chemicals and it's also better for the environment to not be using so much plastic. So, Is there anything in the research for companies that produce water or iced tea or whatever drinks say that are in plastic such as this? Is there anything on the horizon that is a safer alternative? So I actually recently read a new article and um, it's this company Valspar and they are working on creating a safer BPA version of, to like line plastic bottles in and cans. So BPA is a huge chemical of concern in the plastics and packaging category because often cans will be brushed with BPA or the lining of the cap will be brushed with BPA in glass bottles. So it's like always kind of prevalent so having this company kind of figure out ways they started at the very like bottom and built up to try and figure out a chemical compound that would not act as an endocrine disrupting chemical so having this kind of new exciting product to like research more about is really interesting but i mean i we can't be sure yet because it's kind of new right. research what, but what about it's exciting. do you think there should be warnings on on things i mean you're saying you know, I could get really crazy about this because I'm a little bit of a health fanatic myself. Occasionally, I, I go off the rail, but for the most part, I try to participate in um, living well. So, for instance, you're saying this, I can't see it because I'm, I'm old and I don't have reading glasses on, but so if it has a three, six, or a seven, how would I know that? And shouldn't I be told, like, there should be a warning on it, like it's on a cigarette pack? You know, this may cause something, don't overindulge in this. Um, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think that is like we need a law dream is to have that. But I mean, it's it's kind of unrealistic at this point. So I feel like that's why protect our breasts is so important because we're giving people these facts. So even if they're not being publicly placed on labels and everything like that, we still are providing this information so people can look for what to avoid. So I will like we'll have pictures on our social medias that will have the actual logo so people know what to look for. They'll know which numbers to look for. And I think that that's like what we are doing to try and kind of counteract some of that. I, I think that's awesome.
I the, see in your horizon maybe going to government and trying to pass some kind of a law that if we yeah. have to know if it has trans fats in it, and we have to know if it's going to kill us if we smoke it, we should know and we should be, it should be told to us that overindulging in this product or putting it in the freezer or putting it in the microwave could potentially raise our risk of cancer. I mean, why wouldn't they want to say it? Why so there is legislation that was passed, uh, the Luttenberg um, legislation, the Toxic Substance Control Act, which was finally um, brought forth through in the Obama administration. We were very excited about it, although it was really supposed to take a pretty long time to review all the chemicals each year because there are 80,000 chemicals that are in our environment that haven't actually had enough testing done on them. So the legislation that's out there is um, minimal. The question right now is how, um, to raise how dedicated is the EPA to actually seeing through that testing. Um, it's an area that Protect Our Breasts tries to monitor and share with our audience um, without uh, overstepping into the area of legislation. Because Correct. really what we're about is trying to share um, before, because we really work on the precautionary principle that there is science that we know implicates these chemicals. And if we can share that information, because what, one of the things that's happening at the governmental level is that they're waiting on enough yeah. research to make something uh, banned or not banned. And and we want to get this information out before it's uh, banned years down the line. Especially with social media, these young girls at least can be enlightened at a very young age. I was a smoker. I mean, my mother was a smoker. Jackie Kennedy was smoking while she was pregnant, you know. It's, it's nice that these young girls want to start very young and protect themselves from this because it, it can be done. Yeah. And that's key. That, that's key because it's the buildup of all these things that contribute to the, the incidence of breast cancer later in life, correct? correct. Yeah. yeah. And the, we're very concerned about uh, younger women also with their personal care and cosmetics. It's an area that thankfully there have been, um, there's been more attention paid to the issues around cosmetics. People are starting to wake up to the fact that um, there are a number of chemicals that you really have to avoid in your shampoo and other kinds of personal care. So words like phthalates and uh, parabens are words that are now starting to get into the vernacular. People are starting to be able to identify them. And we're very, very grateful to the brands that indicate that they are free of these various chemicals because it helps consumers make better decisions. Do you Does, post those products on your website, the, the ones that are free of the, chemi of the chemicals? You know, one of the things you, you were kind of alluding earlier to, I'd love to know the, the various um, products that are better than others. We are very careful not to share specific brands because when we share a particular brand, they could simply go back to their ingredient list and change it up. And we may be recommending a product that actually is not as safe as we had originally thought it gotcha. was. So I it's looking that. for those words like paraben free, et cetera. Exactly. That is key. And we actually have tip cards. You can download a tip card on our website okay. and on Facebook that will tell you the kind of beginner things to look for in the grocery store that I think is really helpful. Yeah, I mean, we definitely highlight that people should be eating organically because that is just reducing your exposure to all the pesticides and synthetic pesticides that can be especially harmful. Is that FDA and organic or is there another level of organic that you suggest? Because I know a lot, lots of times people say that FDA organic is really not even organic anymore. Like the banana doesn't even smell like a banana if it's FDA organic. So <laughs> what level of organic are you suggesting? Listen, I'm all about organic, but yeah, sometimes do, you can't find the USDA it. USDA organic. <laughs> We're laughing about it partly because this is an issue that's, um, it's, it's been spreading all over about whether or not the USDA organic is a real standard. Yeah. And we um, have an amazing advisory. If you ever get a chance, go to protectourbreast.org and look at the people who are on our advisory. And um, one of the, the woman who actually brought the organic standards to this country, who's also been the um, head of the International Federation of Organic Movements, Catherine DiMatteo, 
is one of our advisors. So we are in constant contact with what is organic and is organic viable. And the truth of the matter is that um, companies are slapped with a $10,000 a day fine if they are found to not actually meet the standards of organic and say they do. So we know that the the USDA organic standard is real. What, What are the standards to meet to be organic? Oh my goodness, that's about 385 pages worth of it. They can still put chemicals on it, correct? It's a huge document, but the fact is that that each category, like meat, meat and and dairy, are, are different than uh, for fruits and vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. But the the basic bottom line is that you can't use synthetic chemicals or um, hormones or um, you know there are a variety of kind of basic things, and and the ones that we're mostly concerned about are those that are related to toxins. So synthetic pesticides and hormones are really our biggest concern. I'm gonna bring this down to a simple level and um, I've changed my eating a tremendous amount this year for health issues. And so I am a big believer because I'm a very different person than I was a year ago. Um, So now starting to buy things that are organic, um, it hits you in the wallet. So are there any suggestions of of ways that you can switch your eating to a more organic diet and yet still stick within your budgets? I'm going to ask Sophie to actually talk about that because the truth of the matter is that I have been an organic shopper for a very long time and I have found that there are a variety of things that you can do to you know, reduce the expense because it is an issue for all of us. But for college age women, it's really an issue. So exactly. I'd like Sophie to answer that. Um, I think it's definitely really, really difficult to kind of figure out stores that have cheaper products that are organic but it's definitely manageable. And here at UMass, I know that like the big chain grocery stores, all of them have organic. So I kind of always scope out, see which ones have the lower costs. And it really does vary store to store and different locations. So if you try different locations, you might find something that's a dollar cheaper than where you're normally shopping. It kind of depends on where you live, which is a sad reality, but I mean, that is a very true. So it's a commitment. You have to make a commitment to eating this way in order to be healthy and live a long, full life free of illness. So you have to commit to doing that legwork to find what works for you. Yeah, and as Cynthia said earlier, we can spend the money right now to buy these organic products, or we can actually pay the consequences and pay the price later on. That's probably that's what it's going to be more expensive later on. So, I mean, personally, I would rather buy the organic and just feel confident in my food choices. Prevention, Absolutely. prevention is the key. So exactly. you know, I want to ask and you a question. One of the things how, that how we um, use a lot is what's on our food, which is an app that's available through the Pesticide Action Network, that's which is an amazing organization that analyzes, it takes the USDA and, and EPA numbers and actually indicates the number of pesticide residues on the average per uh, fruit or vegetable or whatnot. So for example, we know that there are 44 pesticide residues, different pesticide residues on the average conventional apple. I was going to so ask you that before we because that there- some people scrub their fruit and some people just wipe it. I, I wash my fruit and I wipe it, but I have friends that actually scrub it, sometimes with bleach. <laughs> wow. So the interesting thing about this that I actually learned the other day is that these pesticides could be sprayed at the roots. So if they could get inside the actual inside. system of the fruit. So I was like, oh, well, what about an orange? You're just spraying it on the outside. Isn't the fruit protected? But in actuality, they can be a systemic pesticide and go and actually contaminate the fruit inside. That's crazy. Yeah, it's, I mean. It's really disturbing. So, it really <laughs> yeah. is. It makes, you, it makes you weary about eating anything. It's just insane. But I want to yeah. ask you a question, uh, Sophie. How, how old are you? I am 20. You're 20. So when I was 20, Remarkable. I was probably um, driving myself into Manhattan and, and partying on a rooftop. Uh-huh. What, what enlightened you or got you to a place where at a young age like this, this is what you're working on and you're interested in? I mean, I'm so impressed. And, and I just want to thank Julia um, for introducing me to, to you women. I just think it's wonderful, and even that she's a part of it. But what made you get involved in this? Was it did, well, your mom had gre- breast cancer maybe or...? Um, actually, no one in my family has had breast cancer, but I have struggled with my own endocrine disrupting chemical issues and the health consequences of that. So that kind of sparked my interest in this whole 
idea. And also my lifelong dream has been to be an OBGYN. So wow. I am super passionate about women's health. And this has always been something that I've been super into throughout my entire kind of life. I've wanted to help women. And so this has been the perfect opportunity to com combine public health, which is all about prevention and getting the message out to people before things become an issue later on. So it's like the perfect combination of all of my interests into one organization. And it's been so amazing for me to be aware of all these chemicals. I've changed my lifestyle entirely. And I mean, just even being able to be to read the science is so incredible. Just, we know so much and we have all this information and be, to be able to like be the holder of that and then give that to my peers and make sure that my friends are being also like empowered by this information is such an incredible feeling. And I mean, it's just been probably the best thing that I've done in college. I think, well, that, I think that's wonderful. I just want to ask one more question. Do you, so your lifestyle, I always have the 8515 lifestyle. That's how I roll. So 85% of the time I'm watching everything I do, everything I eat, every step I'm taking, and then 15% of the time I'm throwing it up to God and I'm having that second martini. Are you 85-15, yeah. 80-20, 90-10? I'd say I'm 90-10. All right. Um, That's what I've been I shooting so, for. Yeah, I like to spread so much information that I actually like cut dairy out. And so, I mean, and that has actually made me feel so amazing. So, um, I don't know. I'm just someone who like the more I read, I think the more I yeah. kind of alter what I'm eating because I get so... Yeah. freaked out it by it. it and so i'm like oh wow i should probably be eating the organic grapes and like yeah. sophie don't eat the non-organic it's not yeah. worth it so and also i think i mean I, it's just kind of like figuring yeah. out a good balance and exactly. i also follow the guides that we have i scan my makeup through the ewg skin oh, deep healthy living app um makeup i think it's called healthy living now they switched it but I scan all my makeup products and make sure that everything is kind of, they rate them on scales of like a developmental concern, a cancer concern and one other, and neurotoxin. it's neurotoxin concern. And so by following these different kind of resources that we have, I mean, I've been able to reduce my exposures in like immensely. Like it's, I think about how I lived my life before Protect Our Breasts and I ate organic, but I didn't think about anything else that I was putting on my body or in my body. And so it's just been really cool to be so, in aware and to be able to feel really comfortable talking about this and like actually having the conversation. I feel like that's the most important part of our mission is to share the conversation and make sure that everyone can feel like they are empowered and it's not scary, but it's empowering to have this information. That's a really big distinction I like to make. It's like you are now aware and you can make choices that are going to change your future. Yeah, and it's real information. Christine yeah. had a question she wanted uh, to ask. Well, you. just Sophie, you, you, I'm so impressed with you. You really are on your way to reaching those dreams and things that, that you. you've always wanted. Um, you had brought up dairy, and I have learned in the past year that dairy is a huge inflammation trigger for me. Um, yeah. uh, as a person with autoimmune disease. So um, I'm the poster girl for changing what you eat to feel better, live better, be better. So um, I applaud you both. Yeah, thank um, you so Cynthia, much. I mean, I, I, we'd love this. to have you back on because you have so much information. I, I think we could do a whole oh. other hour on this. Absolutely. So we, we need to get back in touch, but we want to thank you so much for coming on. Um, please thank Julia. We really appreciate it. And good luck with uh, Protect Our Breasts. And I, can you um, announce your uh, gift giving um, fundraiser that you guys are doing? Absolutely. I, I want to dovetail on what Sophie said because she kept using the word empower. And what we ask people during this season of gift giving is to consider going to protectourbreasts.org backslash donate and becoming an empowerment patron. So individuals are asked to join our journey in empowering young women. And so we hope that people will take this opportunity to um, donate and to provide a gift and to join us on this incredibly important journey. Thank it's you fantastic. so much. And, and we're going to look into getting some links to, to the groups and some of the other yeah, on, organizations on the, on the page. that you mentioned um, so that they can find it right there if they're watching the show. Thank you so much. Protect Thank you so much for having us. Thank Have a you. great, uh, happy holidays, happy new year, and we will be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye we're now. Gonna, we're going to take a quick break, and we are going to listen to uh, an original song by the Planet X called Can't, Can't Feel the Love. Thank you, Bobby, for letting us share. Can't Feel the Love by Planet X. We'll be right back. Thank you. Now, 
the chase of forever They say never say never But never did you think that this was enough My answer because we lost all the trust When push comes to shove, I can't feel the love I think about you at almost every way I'm interested in what you have to say I kiss your mother, ask her how's her day But you can't feel the love, you can't feel the love We talk for hours on the telephone I tell you all this, we tell you it's been too long You apologize and you tell me you're wrong What if this world could bring this collision on? Christine McCauley, all I want to touch on is if, if dairy means, not having dairy means I can't have pizza, I can't do it. Yeah, it's a little that's problematic the, that's at That's the only times. thing I was thinking about when she was saying no dairy. I'm like, <laughs> wait, does that include dough? Because I don't eat a lot of dairy, but they're, like, I'm not, I can't give up cheese. pizza. Yeah, cheese. cheese. Cheese is a big one. I miss cheese. You know, I'm all about, like I said, the 85-15, a little bit of moderation. Exactly. I can't cut it out totally. Exactly. You know, I have friends who who don't go in the sun, friends who don't eat cheese. You know, if it affects you to the extent that you can't live your life, I get it. But at the same time, um, I could also get hit by a bus. I got to have pizza in my life. Uh, so that's that. But thank you, um, Cynthia and Sophie. That was great. We could have done another half hour on it. Um, I would love to have them back. Right, Christine? Absolutely. This we, is such an important topic. And you know what? We're getting educated, too. Okay. So we're, we're here right. sitting We're sitting here doing a show, and we're actually really interested in what we're talking about, and we're getting educated, too. And what kills me is that I wish that at 20 years old, I had my head screwed on straight, and I was doing that at 20. Right. Because I didn't really get like that. I always ate healthy because of the whole Mediterranean thing. That's how I grew up. We didn't go out to eat. We didn't have a lot of money. So it was all about eating, um, you know, fruits and vegetables. And I remember when a peach tastes like a peach, right. which that really doesn't happen anymore. Um, even with the organic stuff sometimes, it doesn't really taste like it's supposed to taste. Um, but I think it's, it's great information. And these young girls that are taking care of their bodies, when they're 60, 70, 80, they are going to be thanking God that they did, um, even if they don't believe in God. But uh, I think uh, Christine's going to introduce our, our next guest, who I just want to say thank you for coming on, sharing your story. I mean, you know, well, a friend I, of Christine's. Yeah, I, I am thrilled to introduce our next guest. Her name is Maria Pippin. She's coming to us through Skype today, also uh, from Maryland, Salisbury, Maryland. 
She is one of my closest, dearest friends. We have been with each other through the worst there absolutely is and the best that there absolutely is. And today we're going to talk about one of the worst. Maria is a breast cancer survivor, eight years now, and we're going to hear her story and then discuss some of this toxic uh, interference and her opinions on that. So, hi Maria. Welcome, Maria. Hello, my friend. Hello, Laurie. How are you? Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thanks for in coming stereo. on. In stereo. That's because uh, we're thinking you. alike. We're so in sync. <laughs> thank you so and much. She almost brought me to tears with her introduction. Oh, my oh. gosh. We cry together a lot. <laughs> Good and bad, you as I said. You guys have been friends for a long time. Sweet. It's over 20 years. Yeah, wow. It's over 20 years. And, uh, and we both met at a tough time. Another show. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so we, it's 30 years, sweetheart, just about. <gasps> oh, it's Matthew, not Lucas. I, oh, I'm my. thinking we met with Lucas. Oh, right? my gosh, it is. It's 30 years. Poof, we just yeah, aged okay. 10 years. How's that possible? We're 32. Exactly. I know. <laughs> All right, so let's, um, you know, we don't want to waste our time because this is such important stuff. Um, so did I you know Ma Maria before? Yes. Okay, so before yes. she got diagnosed. Okay, yes. so we'll and, go into. And she was actually diagnosed um just when we were planning on getting together for a trip and I couldn't get down to Maryland quick enough. So, so Maria, um, tell, tell our audience and Lori uh, and everybody that's listening um, about when you were diagnosed, how old you were, what stage uh, you were diagnosed I, I, at. I would like to know, how, what did you bring yourself to the doctor or did you, did you feel a lot? I'm, I was telling Christine yesterday, I know a lot about living well. I don't know a lot about uh, illness and sickness. So if I sound uneducated, it's because I am. Um, You're so uneducated until it, it, it directly affects. Well, us. that's it. Um, yeah. So I had gone for my yearly exam, what we all look forward to every year. Okay. And um, you didn't feel anything. The doctor had examined, done the breast exam. Everything seemed fine. Um, he ordered my yearly mammogram, and I promptly put the paper in my pocketbook um, where it sat. Um, I was 45 years old. Um, this was uh, eight years ago. Um, I then, uh, probably about a month after my exam had come home for work one day, uh, you know, took my work clothes off, put on a comfortable sweatshirt and was leaning against the arm of the couch, sitting there watching television and kind of had my hand like this against the arm of the couch. And I went, Oh, uh -oh. what's that? Um, doesn't feel normal. I don't remember feeling it before. So to said to myself, um, I should probably schedule that mammogram, which I did. Um, when I got there, I told them that I had felt something. So they changed it from what's called a screening mammogram, which is what we all typically have, uh, to a diagnostic, which just meant that they took an extra set of views. Uh, they came into me a few moments later and said, we don't see anything. Um, but since you felt something, the, the uh, radiologist is here, we'll do a sonogram. So they did. Um, and again, they said they didn't see anything on the sonogram. Um, wow. So put it out of my head. Uh, probably about a week later, my gynecologist's office called and said, we got the report. Um, it's not showing anything, but since you felt something, you may want to consider seeing a surgeon. Um, so in my ignorance about it, and I worked in the medical field, um, I, uh, but not that particular area, um, I said to them, I said, well, you know, see a surgeon when? Today or six months from now? I, I don't know how this works. And they said, well, probably sooner rather than later. And you got so I had a friend who was a surgeon. Um, I asked if that was somebody they recommended. They said, sure, you know, he does that. Um, went to him. Um, and while he was doing a physical exam, we were kind of catching up on our kids. They had gone to school together and uh, he felt it. So in my mind, I was like, all right, I'm not crazy because it did not show up on a mammogram and did not show up on a sonogram. Right. Um, so they decided to biopsy the spot. Um, I went back for the results of the biopsy about a week later, and when um, when I walked in, he said, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but it's cancer. Oh um, at that point, your oh, mind I'm is crying. reeling. Um, what are my options? What are, you know, every question possible is going through your, through your mind, and most of it being, um, am I going to live to see my children grow up? Um, at that point, he said it was minimum stage two, possibly stage three, that the cells were very aggressive and fast growing. Um, but then he looked at me and said, but you're young, thin, and pretty. I would just get a lumpectomy. Oh, my and God. And I looked at him, and I said, I don't remember and this. if I was old, fat, and ugly, would my treatment plan be different? Wow. And wow. I took myself out of that office and 
Wow. Got myself very quickly learned I needed to be my own advocate. Wow. Uh, That's disturbing. That going to fight for me as hard as I would. Wow. So that was the beginning of my journey. Yeah. I'm sorry that, that he said that to you. I, I'm sure you've told this to me, and I try to block things. I'm an escapist, as you know, <laughs> that um, so, uh, are upsetting. So I'm sorry that, yeah, that's, that you that's had him terrible. say that to you, my friend. That's terrible. I want to ask you a question because, like I said, I'm, un, I'm uneducated. So from mm -hmm. the um, uh, sonogram, they can tell what kind of a cell it is? Um, from the biopsy. From the biopsy, they um, could tell what's up. Once they went in and they, they inserted a needle into the area that he felt, that, okay. that I had felt. Okay. Um, and they, they test, when it comes back, it, you're, you're, the cancer cells are graded. Okay. And based on the grade is part of how they stage a cancer. Um, okay. It also depends on size, um, how far it has spread. Um, but what they call the necrosis uh, of the cell, how quickly it's dying off and replacing itself. Okay. Um, they all tell from, from the biopsy. And at, so at that this... was the beginning. Um, it turned out I had stage four. Oh my God. Um, because of how many lymph nodes it had spread to. So it was considered a distant metastasis. Um, uh, and Maria, you so didn't feel anything. I, uh, I just technically this... living with stage four. So you didn't feel anything going up to this. You were fine. You were living your life. You were you weren't tired. You weren't feeling no. any discomfort anywhere. There were no signs. You weren't losing any hair. I mean, nothing that you could attribute going back and saying, "Oh, that was because of that." Nothing. Exactly. Nothing. Um, absolutely nothing. That's other than you know, leaning against the arm of the sofa that day and feeling something that didn't feel normal. No. Um, and in my mind, when we do our self exams and, and um, when we're, we're told to what look out for, when you hear the word lump, I always imagined that if I ever felt anything, it would be, um, you know, something round and, and pliable, uh, a, a pea or a small marble or something. That's what this I'm thinking. felt like a strand of string pearls. It was maybe felt about two inches long um, and had like almost multiple little sections is what I felt. Wow. Um, and not what that's, I ever would have that's thought great that I was looking for. Wow. Um, so that was kind of educational to me. Now, did you um, go for a mammogram the prior year? Yes. So how many mammograms have you, did you have prior to the one that you diagnosed you? At that point I had had five. I was 45 years old. They started them when I was 40. Wow. Now, did you have family history of breast cancer? No family history. I had my children young. I nursed all of them for well over a year. I have four children. Did you smoke? Um, so other than the smoking factor. Okay, I smoked. I was a smoker. Yeah. Uh, you know, was no family history. So really a pretty, um, did they what know, we'd always heard about the risk factors did for they breast know cancer. About the, um, I was low on the totem pole. Did they know about the BRCA gene back then or no? Uh, they did. Did they um, test you right away? I negative for it. Because um, it was eight years ago, so the BRCA gene was was uh, at that point um, being analyzed. Do they test you right away for that, or no? That's not something because you didn't have a family. No, history. we didn't do it right away. There was really no need to. We knew there was no history of it in my family. Okay. Um, okay. But it was more for my daughter's sake. Right. Okay. Now I don't know if you were able to uh, listen into the beginning of the show at all, and the organization we had on uh, called yes. Protect Our Breasts, and and their philosophy about toxins when we're young that build up mm -hmm. and and can make us at risk for breast cancer. I'm wondering your thoughts on that. When you look back at your life prior to diagnosis, is there something again? Mm -hmm. We'll put the smoking aside, but um, you go diet up on Long coke Island? or she grew up on Long, Long Island. Island. Um, you know, what are your thoughts along those lines? What, what those ladies had to say was incredibly interesting. Um, Wasn't it? I have always thought um, that I grew up in one of the highest incident areas in the right. country, Long Island. Um, I li live down here now on the eastern shore of Maryland, which is one of the second highest rates in the country. Wow. Um, and I have always felt that geologically, the two areas are very similar. Um, while Long Island is an island, we are practically an island, um, the peninsula here, surrounded by the Chesapeake Bay on one side and the Atlantic Ocean on the other. Um, our water filtration systems are almost exactly the same. We go through sand and then through shale, through pine barrens. So for all the years that this land and on Long Island was farmland, and there were years and years of pesticides leaching into our groundwater. 
Um, and now it's become housing developments and the aquifers are, are you know, pulled for our drinking water. Um, I always gave a lot of thought to that um, and have become very mindful of what I put back into the environment through my trash um, or what we're, we're, you know, the pesticides we use on our lawn um, to have that perfectly green lawn. Um, that's all going into our groundwater. Um, but yes, I drank Diet Coke and and, you know, you think of all those things and all the years of, of chemicals coming out of plastic containers um, and, uh, you know, right. not necessarily eating organic because orga organic has really only been a thing um, that we've heard about in the news kind of since around the time I was diagnosed. Right. I agree um, with you. So, so I think so I was, you know, as blissfully yeah. ignorant about it all as the majority of people are. Yeah. So we, we want to we want to circle back yeah. to to your journey about you got diagnosed, you had a bad experience with your OBGYN, you switched OBGYNs, and now you had to decide what to do. How did you even yeah. begin to decide what to do, and did you have to do it quickly? Yeah. It wasn't my OBGYN. It was it was a surgeon. I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry. That I've had that experience with. So I mentioned I worked in the medical field. I worked for cardiologists at the time, and I had went to work and told them what had happened and. Um, they were outraged, um, and they, two of the doctors I worked for remembered that one of their professors from medical school had started a breast center, um, at, up in Towson, um, Maryland, just north of Baltimore, which is about three hours from where I live. Um, and they took the time and got on the phone and begged and pleaded and got me an appointment in with, um, a Dr. Lauren Schnapper. Um, from the University of Maryland and uh, Towson Medical, uh, Greater Baltimore Medical Center, um, got me in with her. Um, and from there, I had a doctor who sat with me on the Friday of a holiday weekend for two and a half hours and went through step by step um, what we could probably expect my journey to be um, on all the different scenarios on on if what she found during surgery was this, then this would be the protocol. And if it was that, that would be the protocol. Um, she then, after they did the surgery, I did have a double mastectomy. Wow. Um, they did have to remove um, well over 30 lymph nodes. The cancer had spread to 16 of them. Um, and it spread very quickly. It was a very aggressive form. I was what they call um, ERPR negative and HER2 triple positive. So. The ER and PR is estrogen and progesterone, which the majority of breast cancers um, feed off of that. Um, so I think everybody's heard of the drug tamoxifen, um, which is and very simplistically is like a, a, sw a light switch where it, it switches off what feeds the cancer. So for anybody whose breast cancer is that, that drug makes a huge difference. Um, mine was not um, one of those receptors, so it wasn't gonna respond to that. Um, what I did have was the Herceptin um, or uh, the HER2 um, oncogene, um, and mine was triple positive, which makes it a very aggressive, very fast growing cancer. Um, and a drug called Herceptin had only come out and been FDA approved about six months before my diagnosis, and that drug saved my life. Wow. Um, she introduced me then to the oncologist that I ended up going to, and Chris has heard me refer to him many times as I have a date with my adorable Irish oncologist. <laughs> um, uh, he, um, he saved my life, wow. um, by being up on, on the latest, um, progressions in breast cancer treatment, um, by, um, having an incredible outlook, um, that I think he just fosters in his patients. Um, and, um, so I ended up going three hours from home for treatment for all my surgeries. Um, I ended up with seven or eight surgeries, wow. um, with the reconstruction, um, and I had some post-surgical issues that had to be addressed, um, pretty immediately because I was, um, the cancer was growing so fast, wow. um, that they had to start chemo as quick as possible. So I went through 18 months of chemo. I had eight hardcore treatments, um, every three weeks. Um, and then I had followed up with close to a year of just the Herceptin. Um, and then in the middle of that, I also had, um, almost 60, um, daily radiation treatments. Um, how did you keep so. yourself, how did, uh, cause I'm just thinking like, you know, how did you just keep yourself going without just collapsing? I know you kid, you're going to say my children, my children, but realistically there had to be days that, you know, you just 
was scraping his oh, off the floor. Um, and as the treatments progressed, um, they get rougher. Um, they hit you harder and harder, each one. Um, but definitely my children. Yeah. Um, my children, my pets, you know, um, being the treasurer for the PTA, um, having a full-time job, uh, and thankfully working somewhere that was um, very agreeable to me having a very flexible schedule. Um, when I felt good, I went to work. When I didn't feel good, I didn't. Um, and if I felt good on a Sunday, I went into the office on a Sunday and worked so because important. I may not feel good Thursday and Friday. Yeah, that's um, so important to have so that So I was support. very blessed in that aspect. Um, they um, were very willing uh, to work with how I was feeling. Um, I had an incredible group of friends, um, Chris among them. I'm um, sure. Who were here for everything. I see that. Um, I didn't break down and cry a lot, and thankfully they didn't let me. She was remarkable. Um, because, I mean, sometimes you need to, but I also didn't need to be surrounded by people that were um, naysayers, yeah. that were expecting me to be deathly ill, to die. Um, the, the more positive... And I found myself gravitating towards that. I started to shift away from the people who were expecting me um, to lay down and die right. figuratively. Uh, um, um, unfortunately, I, Ray, our time is starting to wrap up. Um, but I, I did want to ask, ask one more okay. question. Um, ask? I, I did want to ask you, um, well, there's two things, actually. I think Lori's thinking of one. Um, first of all, what would your message to others be that are just getting this diagnosis and looking ahead at this this very difficult journey what what would be the one thing you'd really want to say to them stay positive um sense of humor is key i laughed my way through a lot of it not that i didn't cry i don't i don't want to make myself sound like a hero um but you have to have a positive outlook you have to see yourself on the other side of it um i mean i joke but at 45 years of age and after nursing four kids i have fabulous new boobs um, there is <laughs> i bet you do <laughs> uh, it is not all bad so i, I mean i would have to, and that and and be your own advocate. If you are not comfortable with the answers you get, if you are not comfortable with the person who is putting your life in their hands, then change Good, quickly. Ron. That's excellent. And, and the, the other thing, I want to ask wanna... you one question because um, sure. we all have friends and, and family members who go through this and we don't, what could we do other than cooking? Cause we know we could cook and, and make you laugh. What could we do for a woman that's going through this journey? What would you think could be the best thing that we could do? As a friend, um, a sister, mother? Absolutely. Um, don't buy the package of mushrooms with the pink ribbon on it. It's not helping ask. her um, <laughs> in a broad sense. Um, individually, pick up her kids from basketball practice, clean her toilets. Okay. Um, you know, a meal is great, but um, coming in and, you know, my husband was trying to do it all, take care of the lawn, um, you know, take care of the inside of the house, run the kids back and forth when I wasn't feeling like it. Um, and I think like most women, we have trouble asking for help. Absolutely. Um, so I think if you got together with a group of friends and paid for a, a merry maids or, or some kind of maid service, you know, just once a month even to go in and do some of the bigger stuff that you just don't feel up to doing. Because when you have your energy, you want to spend it on your family, yep. um, not doing chores around the house. Um, you know, just call her up and say, I got the kids this afternoon. Um, I had many friends that would, my two youngest were um, uh, 12 and 13 years old um, when I was diagnosed. Um, so it was a rough age for them. Um, and the friends that would just say, I'm going to pick the boys up from school and keep them for dinner and they can play with my boys. And, and I didn't have to think or I didn't have to call and ask. Um, I think just, just do it. Don't wait for her to ask. Wonderful. We want to thank you for coming on. And I just want to say I would love to have... Uh, you back with one or two of your children to talk about what they felt while you were going through this journey because I can only imagine that a young child of that age would probably have their own worries, concerns, feelings, uh, fears, and everything else. Um, you sure. are a hero. Please don't think that you're not because um, you know the next person, the friend. next person that is diagnosed or that hears your story is going to have hope just from hearing what you just said. That you know you can come out the other side and you can laugh about it. So thank you so much for coming on. It's not enough time. It's, it's not, not enough, enough time, time we'll, at we'll all. We'll have so. to have you back. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Next time you it. take a drive up. Thank you. I love you. Thank you so much, Ray.
I love you too, baby. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy holidays. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks, ladies. Bye. I'll call you later. <laughs> All right. I think, uh, I think Bobby's going to be telling us to wrap it up soon. So um, on a close, we just want to say thank you so much to our guests for coming on. Uh, it's not enough time. It's I'm such loving, important. I'm loving living, living in the living room. Yes. Yeah, with such Christine. Important information. Right? And, right? Uh, Protect our breasts. Uh, dot com, right? Protect dot org. Dot org. Go on. Thank you, Julia, for introducing us to uh, those ladies with all that information. And please visit our page, The Living Room, um, on Facebook. We're going to be posting pictures, links, and all sorts of good information. Christine, you want to close up? Um, yes. Uh, Lori, you kind of covered it all. Please go to that, those web pages. We're going to try to get those links up. And um, reach out to us with what's important to you so that we can uh, continue to give good information about living here on The Living Room. Come sit with us. Have a great weekend. Given what we know about the benefits of filing a property tax grievance, experts agree it should be mandatory. Use a professional. Choose Zap My Tax. File at ZapMyTax.com. Deadline approaching.